Good afternoon or uh, good morning if you are watching from China. So this is Hong Bin Li. I'm the faculty co-director of a new center. I think probably the youngest center at Stanford. The Stanford Center on China's Economy and Institutions, we call it SKY in short. So for this audience, I don't have to spend too much time uh, to explain how important China's economy is for today's world. Despite its importance, unfortunately, the world today knows very little about China beyond a few media reports. At the moment, there are huge gaping holes in our knowledge about what's going on in China's economy. And there are very few economists in top US schools studying China. So this is why we established this new center, uh, the sky, to better understand China's economy, to fill this knowledge gap. I think Scott is going to spend more time uh, to explain what uh, Sky is. But uh, to be short, Sky is Stanford's home for empirical, multidisciplinary research on China's economy. We aim to foster uh, path-breaking research to create transformative student experiences and to advance public understanding of China's economy and its impact on the world. We are very pleased to partner with Stanford Alumni Association today to offer this China Chess event series. Our goal is to host a series of faculty talks to bring the latest China research and insights from Stanford to our, our alumni and friends. We hope to be able to see everyone in person very soon. Uh, but before that, we are hosting these uh, events online in Zoom. With that, let me introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Scott Rosell. Scott is a Highland Farnsworth professor and my co-director of Sky here at Stanford. So Scott has been studying China for I think 30 to 40 years. So I myself met Scott in China three years ago. So when I first graduated from college, uh, when he was conducting fieldwork in rural Shanxi. And two years later, luckily, I came to Stanford as a PhD student of Scott. Uh, Scott's work is very influential. Uh, many of you have heard of his Chinese name, Luo Scao. Uh, it's a so-called Wang Hong name. He has visited over 650 counties in China. That's over half of all the counties in China. So he founded the Rural Action, Education Action Project over a decade ago and has been directing it. It focuses on studying China's rural education and health, as well as human capital in general. He has won many awards and honors from his work from both the United States and China, uh, including the Friendship Award from Premier Wen Jiabao. Today, Scott will introduce his uh, new book, Invisible China, which summarizes uh, some of the important results from his research and fieldwork. So here's the plan for today's uh, event. So Scott will first spend about 30 minutes to present a few key findings from the book. Uh, after that, we are going to open up for questions. You can ask a question anytime in the Q&A box. Scott, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Hongbin. Uh, thank you. Uh... Tina and Leslie, thank you to the Alumni Association. Um, uh, I've talked to different alumni groups over the years. This is the first time to Zoom, and I, I don't think I've ever talked to over 150 people at the same time. This is the silver lining of this black cloud, right? Um, so it's it's great to, to uh, talk to you. Uh, what Hongbin and I really want to do is be together with you <laughs> and uh, uh, interact in person, and, and soon, soon. Um, you know, I have my two vaccines, I'm ready to go. So, uh, okay, um, uh, before I get, I'm gonna give you some background first, but but I always wanna start out, you know, the, this human capital problem, it threatens China's rise. Uh, but I, this is not a China bashing book. It, as, a, as a matter of fact, it's really a book trying to say, you know, how do you, you know, what are the challenges and how do we go about solving those challenges? And I do that, you know, 
Uh, home being very nice in 30 years. I, I've been going to China for 40 years. I, I started at Stanford 31 years ago <laughs> and, uh, in 1990. Uh, and um, so you know, I have friends in rural China. Um, I'm worried about the economy and what's good for China is good for the US and the world. And it's good for overall Asia, of course. Okay, and you know, believe me, in some circles in the U.S., it's not very politically correct to say that I want China to succeed. Um, you know, I want them in a fair, cooperative, all-encompassing way. But but you know, I want that to happen, right? So so what's the invisible China? This this doesn't need. I don't need to spend a lot of time in when I'm talking to a group in China. It's invisible China equals rural China. Okay, you know, 1.4 billion people, 60% uh, of them, 840 million of them are rural Chinese. I, I, tell, I tell the rest of the world, one out of nine people in the world are, you know, rural in rural China or they're, they have a rural hukou, right? More than double the US population. And, you know, they're the workers, the informal service workers. Um, I'm going to come back to that later on. So this is the DD uh, drivers, the 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 tan fan jingji, right? The uh, the the farmers markets, the little stores, uh, it, all those jobs in China that um, are in this self-employed service worker. They run the farms. They're the elderly, the children. They're the migrants. Okay, I mean you guys know that, right? Um, now, it's really invisible to many of you in this group. Now, I know some of it's not, but, but when I first started in China in the 1980s, early 1980s, 85% of Chinese lived in rural communities and a higher percentage obviously had families. Um, if you are a college student or a professional or government official, you almost always came from a rural community and you'd go back and forth. Uh, and you, do you remember the buses? <laughs> you know, for those old alumni who graduated in the 80s and 90s, right? When we took that bus, it took us a day and a half to get back across a province and a half. And we had to stop at the village inn and eat at the farmhouse restaurant. We knew rural China, right? Uh, it wasn't invisible 30 to 40 years ago. But today, right, either you get on a plane <laughs> or you get on a high speed rail, right? And at at 350 kilometers an hour, I, I'm a terrible photographer, okay, but I love to take photos. But you can't take a photo of a village on a high-speed train. It's going too fast. It blurs. I mean, we, it's, you know, this is the China, especially in the U.S. Like Hongbin says, our center really wants to explain to the, to the audience in the U.S. and Europe and uh, our, our other um, countries around the world what China is. They know this. They 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 don't know this. The invisible China, right? And uh, so that's that's what this book is doing. Um, so what it's based on, Combe and already sort of said, right? Uh, I I'm a development economist. I uh, you know started in the Food Research Institute, and then I'm now in the uh, Freeman Sposley Institute of International Studies, and we do field work. We go into the field. Uh, like I said, 650 counties. One job I'll ask me in 1997, how many counties I'd been to. He was Fuzhongli. He was a vice premier at the time. And you know, I said, I hadn't counted. And he said, count. And, and then 13 years later, when he gave me the, the friendship award, I said to him, um, 550. And he says, what? He says, I've been to 550 uh, premier and uh, counties. And he goes, Oh, you're Luo <laughs> Sugao. And he says, you have been counting. And he says, I've been to 1,048. <laughs> and uh, so that was uh, the encounter there. And we've done millions and I mean, literally a million surveys in villages of students, teachers, parents, principals, rural factories, doctors, hospitals. Uh, to really try to understand this economy. So, yeah, I, I was like, that. I mean, when I took that picture, my son, who's a uh, Stanford 2005 econ major, <laughs> um, uh, uh, who now works for a Chinese company, Tencent, he works for Yingzhong Lianmeng <laughs> for Riot.com in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but he was, he's older than me when I took that picture. And, you know, look at catching, we caught our dinner and, you know, the kids, thousands of kids in the, in the villages. And this is me today, right? We still work with the children and because uh, this is your future, right? 70% of 
China's future population is a, a, a rural Kuko child right now. So um, uh, that's who we care about. Uh, this is another one of my colleagues. <laughs> it's Hongbin. This is Hongbin in the field. This is when he was young uh, and teaching at Tsinghua. And, um, and then he goes to the field too, into the factories and the labor, uh, et cetera. And his, uh, he's going to be talking a lot about his work uh, in a month at the next China chat. Uh, and we take Stanford professors um, you know, who don't even, who work on Mexico, who uh, work on South Asia. And uh, right here, you know, we, that our students, you know, are now professors at UNC in the Graduate School of Education at Brown University, at Harvard. Um, where, where's that? <laughs> I was, you know, I don't know where Harvard is, but it, this guy's there now. So let's, uh, and we take students and we work with the students of China. This is probably one of our biggest impacts is to create this linkage that, that you know, we take you know, our teams there and we work with the students of China and share our knowledge and learn from them. Um, and uh, uh, this is Sky. Uh, um, uh, so REAP, my group used to do just rural education health and, and the early childhood development has combined with uh, Hongbin Lee's China program, and we've created this center sky, right? The center, uh, Stanford Center for Chinese, on Chinese economy and, and um, institutions. Um, and uh, it's multidisciplinary. <laughs> we were economists and political scientists and sociologists and empirical uh, social scientists. We work with doctors, we work with business school, we work with the law school, we, we, we work with the engineering school to really study uh, China's economy. And uh, uh, so we have links all across campus and we connect the policy centers. And one of our big things is we're translational and we really look forward to sharing uh, empirically based results, not anecdotes. We aren't gonna accept our opinions. We're gonna share facts, from empirical data that's high quality publishable data, but we're gonna translate it into a form where it can be understood. And we're gonna share it with Washington DC, New York, Silicon Valley, businesses in China and, and more in Japan and South Korea, uh, Australia, Europe. Okay, and um, that's what our center is, uh, is really looking to become. We wanna be the platform that can really try to understand China's economy and its linkage to the world. Um, so, okay, let's get going. <laughs> My book. <laughs> oh yeah, the book. Uh, so uh, how does invisible China threaten China's rise? Okay. And threaten means it's not a done deal. And, you know, I'm an economist, like Hongbin said, that's worked on China for 40 years. You know, I was here during the inflation of the 1990s, post Tiananmen, state-owned enterprise reform, entering WTO, the world's financial crisis of 2008. And every time people would say, China's never going to survive this. And look what they did, right? So, so uh, you know, that's, we want that to continue to happen, okay? Um, so wh why am I worried about it though? So here it is. This is an important graph. It's going to be the only graph really that, I'm going to show you a couple graphs, but uh, this is income. 60 years ago, 1960. This is income today, okay? So these are countries of the world. And so these countries are here like Rwanda or Myanmar, Jimbazai, right, um, uh, uh, et cetera, okay? And here's countries that are rich, rich. They were rich 60 years ago, they're rich today. Uh, Norway, Sweden, Canada, Australia, US, okay, the, the OECD countries, right, the, the Organization of Economic Development and Cooperation, okay. Um, so I'm interested in two groups here. I'm interested in the graduates, okay. These are countries that 60 years ago, they were middle income, and today they're high income, okay. And I want you to notice two things about these countries or territories, okay. Um, uh, cause you know, Taiwan is in there, Taiwan territory, Taiwan province. Okay. Um, and, and what you notice is there's only 15 of them. Okay. 15 in 60 years, 15 countries have gone from middle income to high income. 
Okay, we, we, by the way, we don't count oil countries um, because, you know, it's like the sheik has all the money and everybody else is poor. Okay, and we don't count Eastern Europe because Eastern Europe was rich. They entered the Soviet Union, they became poor and then they became rich. So, but, but there's only 15 countries and territories that have risen like this, okay? Um, the second thing I want you to notice is, look at most of the countries in the world are called the trapped, okay? That means for 60 years, middle income, middle income, middle income, but it's not smooth like that. They grow, 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 collapse. Grow, 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 stagnate. And when this collapse happens in these countries, millions of people inside those countries get hurt. Okay, we often don't even feel it, right? If Colombia in South America goes, oh, no, 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 you know, we don't feel it, but you know, five million people become poor, and there's there's all the spillovers of that. Okay, so I want to really understand, you know, how countries succeed and why they don't. And one real difference between this, okay, there's many differences. But one basic difference, and the one I don't think we spent enough time on, is at the time of middle income, the level of human capital, okay, so uh, so this is the whole labor force, their level of human capital has to be high, okay, when you're still a middle income country, okay, um, and, and uh, high human capital means uh, so the share of your labor force has been to high school or above, okay? And what you can see here is these are the rich countries, right? Today, the rich countries, um, seven out of 10, eight out of 10 um, people in their labor force, 18 to 64, have been to high school or higher, okay? Now look at the graduates, right? These are the South Korea, Ireland, right? Israel, okay? 70, this is when they were middle income. Bashinindai, Joshinindai, okay? They already, Tom and the Lao only, their labor force already had high education levels. In South Korea, it was 90% of, of their labor force, even the Liu Shi already had been to high school, okay? Wow, right? At when they're middle income, okay? Now, let's look at the trapped, right? These are most of the countries. So Turkey, our Mexico, Nanfe, South Africa. And on average, only three out of 10 or four out of 10. And what's about six out of 10 or seven out of 10? Most of the people in this labor force, you know, Right? You, you don't have that ability to learn, okay? And, and, and so that there's a huge part of these labor forces that, and so what's, you, you know, and you can see the difference, right? These are the biesheng, okay? And these are the, you know, uh, the, the, the ones who failed, right? Kaobushang, right? And so, and they're, they're, they're exactly half, okay? And what happens, why is it important is when a country moves from middle income to high income or gets higher, wages rise. <laughs> Hongbin, has, Hongbin Lee has a great paper called The End of Cheap Labor. And it shows from 2000 to 2015, China, you, we know, right? You know, the amount you pay your baomu, the amount you, 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 you pay for, for food in the store, it's gone up because wages have gone up. And then what happens is as you get higher wages is the low wage, low skills go away and you have high wage, high skill jobs left, okay? And if a large share of your labor force can't, can't do that job, there's unemployment. There, you get a rise of tan fan jing ji, right? Because they they can't work in in the investment firm, they can't work in the bank, they can't work in the hospital or the hotel management, right? You get high crime and social unrest. This is for the rest of the world. And of course, if there's lots of unemployment, if there's high crime, investors don't want to invest. You can't find qualified workers. It's it's a vicious cycle down, right? And you get more polarization. So look at these countries that have been stuck in middle income, okay? Argentina, Costa Rica, 
Indonesia. Look at look, look at the red line. Fifty percent or more are in this informal sector, the Tan Van Jingji, right? So the Mayo Igadanwei, you know, Mayo just Mayo Shubao, right? I mean, they're just they're they're guti hu. They're trying to survive from day to day, okay? And these countries, half of their labor force are in these sectors, okay? And you know, it's like this, right? The, the, there they are, okay? This is in Mexico, and this is in Brazil, and this is in uh, Peru, and they live in these slums with you know very poor. Uh, here, here's my. Yeah, he's he's a colleague from Harvard, and he was very smart. He left Harvard, and he went to. Uh, 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 Inter-American Development Bank. Those are major Faja uh, Inhang, okay, in, in Washington. But they work, it's like Yahang, but it's for Latin America. And he, he, his story is Mexico has solid macro performance, okay, export success, and lots of physical capital. Wow, sounds like China, right? <laughs> good macroeconomic performance, good export success, and lots of physical capital, right? Uh, but Mexico has very little growth. They hit middle income 40 years ago, okay? And since that time, and he says, why? It's because productivity has sent it. This informal sector here is too big. Okay, it's it's just too big, and it pulls down the 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 formal sector, and there's too much crime, and there's too much social unrest. Okay, and so that's what he says. And you can look here's Mexico right here, right? <laughs> because six out of ten Mexicans in 1980 couldn't learn how to learn, and they had three options: they could go to the U.S. They could go to the informal economy or they could go into organized crime. And of course, you know, if you know anything about Mexico today, right, 10% by sure, Mexico are some way related to the criminal cartels there and Mexico's a mess, right? So, okay. So there's so many people today that listen to my talk and they, they, they scratch their head and say, you're, you're going to tell me that Mexico is going to be like I mean, China is going to be like Mexico that it could taper off or, or you know, even stagnate. Um, hasn't China already made it, right? Right? That's the, that's the government's official policy. But when I was in grad school, when, when I was took Hong Bin to the field, um, Mexico had already made it. They, do you know Mexico was called the next Taiwan? Okay, because they went into o, Mexico's OECD because they were a rich country, but for 30 years now, Mexico hasn't grown. Okay, okay, that's the theory. Okay, now let's go look at China. Okay, and uh, the, the rest of the book, the first two chapters is about this theory about, uh, you know, high income and, and I mean, graduates and middle income. But let's go look at China now. There's China, middle income. They've gone a long ways. Just Sushinin. <laughs> They've gone a long ways. Of course, we want China to go up here, right? I mean, everybody wants China to become a high income country. So they're still middle income now. Um, so while well, this is repeating, summarizing, all kids don't need to go to college, but all children, when China becomes a Gaodong Shouru to Georgia, the Gorja that if if you don't have a high school education, you're going to be have a really tough time uh, uh, making it. Uh, you know, we need five hundred, five hundred, five hundred, five hundred. You know, like uh, uh, low skill people, but most people should be able to participate in this economy because it's at this stage of development where children get skills they need for the future. So where's China? Okay. This is, I often get gas from this. China has the lowest level of human capital in the middle income world. <laughs> Number one, low. <sighs> yeah, I mean, I, I know people said, really? Come on, I mean, think of, you know, we're Ching, we went to Tsinghua, we went to Fudan, and then we went to Stanford, right? You know, we, we have a great education system. That, whose data are you using? Well, I'm using the Pucha data. 
Okay, you know this data of uh, it's a little 国家做的调查，就是呃十三亿人的调查。And look at in 2015, we asked this 50-year-old, 你你教育水平多高啊、uh, ？Have you ever been to 小学 ？Have you ever been to 中学 ？Right? It's only up here. Have you been to 高中 or 以上 ？Okay, and look at this. Sunshine, thirty percent, only thirty percent of the whole labor force, right? So the labor force is five. So who either some either in have gone to high school, but who either in are high school dropouts, okay?、Um, and you know, as we see the rest of the world, none South Africa's education is better than China's in this dimension. Okay, in 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 and OECD said this is so important for development, right? It's lower than Turkey, lower than Mexico. Okay, so that's why I'm worried about it. Okay, and、um, you know, again, China, 经常是没有办法的办法 right? But、um, we need to think about this, and people aren't talking about it because seventy percent of those in the labor force are what we call high school dropouts, and you know, 在美国 Say, Ojo, if you're a high school dropout, there's a five times more probability that you're、uh, in jail,、uh, on welfare, on unemployment, in disability, have some sort of uh, uh, of、um, uh, criminal record than being a middle income person. Okay, five times more. You don't want to be a high school dropout in a high income country. Seventy percent. Five hundred million Chinese. It's not Yi Chen, you know. High school dropouts make these really good, right? They're really good at making these. Okay.、Um, so, is there any evidence that this is affecting China's economy today? Okay. I, I want to look at some really early data, and this is Zheng Fu the data. Okay. And look, look at the data. Here's、uh, formal employment and shares. Okay. So you can see in two thousand four. Sixty percent of workers in China. So this is a, a secondary and tertiary sectors. Okay,、um, uh, factories and construction sites and 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 service sector. Four sixty percent of them were part of a Danwei have have Shibao、uh, protected by China's laws. Okay, but you can see over the last fifteen years. Look at. It's down to it turned around, right? Sixty percent of them are now these these informal workers, okay? That the male shabal, right? That the laws is sure China's laws protect them, but 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 not very well, right? I mean, this is amazing. Look, you look at there's the for informal jobs going up. Formal jobs are going down now in China, okay? And look at here, manufacturing jobs are going down, construction jobs are going down. Hey, this is the good news. These are you guys, right? <laughs> These are people in you know in investment and in counting and banking and academics and medicine. They're going up. Well, but what's what's going up faster than anything? <laughs> Labor intensive informal services. Okay, <laughs> the DD drivers, right? The Tan Fan Jing Ji. That's going up much, much faster. And why is it going up faster? Because you get laid off from a factory, you go here. You get, you can't go to here, right? You got to go here. And all new 新入了那个劳动力的人 right? The new 新的工人从农村来的 they all have to go into the service sector, and it's going up and up. And if supply goes up, guess what happens to wages? Okay. Wages are falling in this informal wage sector. Growth rate of wages are falling. Hey, the good news is, is your wages are rising, right? But this is the start of a polarization、uh, that's happening, right? High skill, high wage, professional sector. They get employment's going up slowly, and great growth rates. Wages are rising, but this informal economy is booming. But that's not good because. The supply is faster than demand, and the growth rate of wages are falling. Okay, 
So what's driving these trends? <laughs> this is your lecture <laughs> one month from now. Uh, uh, Hongbin will talk about robots of China and China has robots, okay? Um, and globalization, right? Uh, you know, Samsung, all the electronics are in Yunnan, right? If I was with you, I'd show you my, 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 my Levi jeans. They're now made in Ethiopia. Chinese firms have moved to Bangladesh for the cheap wages, right? So that's costing you know, jobs. And of course, COVID-19 and global recession, that's making it, you know, it worse. So should we make, expect more in the future, right? Uh, there it is. I know 2025 isn't there anymore, but China's in commitment. You look at Shi Sun and Jihua, it's you know, technology, 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 which is good, but it's gonna have the negative effect of putting people out of work and getting them shoved into this sector, uh, service sector that's falling. And of course, we're gonna have more supply chains shifts and you know, um, I hope not too fast, but it's gonna happen, right? When wages are expensive. So should we expect more in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you see the start of polarization now, right? And, and I think that we need to worry about that. So what do we hope? You know, if wages of unskilled workers, laborers fall, this should slow automation. Yep, maybe, you know, um, you, know, uh, you know, China's government is pushing policies, you know, dual circulation economy, urbanization, they're, they're investing in, in, in uh, uh, automation. Right is that they that that they're they're really trying to, to 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 stimulate this, but you know can you stimulate an economy when you know Wu Yideren like Li Keqiang said Wu Yideren should Yi Qian Kui Qian Zhi Sha, they should pay less. Right? I mean, and so I think that this is this is what we're we're worried. Now people often ask me, is this, I'm almost done here. Is this a secret? Does China's government know this? Uh, the factor, it, it's not a secret. I think you look at China's government investment here. I don't think they understand the whole problem, but I think they, they know that their education of the labor force is too low. And look at this. In Now, now this is okay? So this is just high school age kids. And in 2005, only Yi Bar was Shang Gaojong. Today, you know, 10 years later, uh, 10 million new slots. China just says high school, high school, high school. So they know that this labor force is, 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 under, uh, is understaffed. And of course, originally, the Chinese government said, Erling Erning Nin Puji. Now they say, now it's Shi Sun Nin Jihua Puji, you know, after COVID. But, but I think this is a great goal. I think it's trying, and it shows you that the government understands that. So if we wanna get this done, what do we have to do? <laughs> you don't have to worry about Cheng Shu Hu Ko the Haidza. Bai Fun Zhe Zhou Shi San the Haidza in urban areas are Shangguo Gaozhong. That's higher than Germany, right? <laughs> we know Germany, Germany is, but in urban China, everybody goes to high school. The problem is rural China. Right, seventy percent. Um, so it needs to focus on these rural youth, and it's mostly Zhongbu and Shibu, the Nongchun. Shenzai, Shenzai, only the of Okay, so that's what we need to do, right? Uh, China cities were fine. Yanhai Di Chu, the Nongchun is fine. It's these Zhongbu, Shibu, and Dagong Zidi the Shichu. Okay, so this is China today. This is Taiwan and South Korea in 1980. Bashanin died, Taiwan, South Korea. Everyone went, everyone went to, to high school, okay? Had been to high school for many years. Look at Mexico in 1980s. China, Mexico, China, Mexico. Wow, that is really, you know, this is what I'm worried about is these are the ones that are in crime informal economy and migrated to the US. And of course, China 
<laughs> we can't have e e ren e min da nali chu you know gong zuo that's just not going to happen so um the challenge to the government is get students from poor rural areas and provide to you know uh, workers who get laid off job training but the biggest job is to make sure they're ready to learn right and according to our research there's a large share of rural people that don't have the skills to learn how to learn right um so what can be done right we want to have adult training and nongchun zhenxing the ikke zhuyao de bufan is patient to uh 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 laid off workers i think that's good we got to figure out how to do it okay but we really need to put a huge investment into lingdao shiba sui uh for for education lingdao shiba sui you know we think the biggest invisible problem if you know any of our work the biggest invisible problem in china are children lingdao san sui in nongchun they parents love their kids they want to send them to college but so should be young Right, they 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 will be young, a farmer, not be young, a young college student. So they want their kid to go to college, but when they get to junior high or high school, they will not be able to. Right. So um, the new efforts I think are Nongchun Zhenxing, Chengshihua, uh, and you know I think these are the right directions. But we have to gong zhong shi jiao. Three things: education, education, education; health, health, health; rural, early childhood development, early childhood development. And so, I'm going to quit there, Hongbin, um, and uh, look forward to talking with the audience. Uh, you know, the alumni group is uh, in a really unique position. Um, so, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks, Scott. There are a lot of questions. Uh, so let me ask the first question here. So I think from the audience, this is a great question from a student. So this student said, "So my parents are, fa are farmers. I was the first college student from the whole village of the family, and then education paved my way up to Stanford. So I'm really uh, curious why you decided to study China 40 years ago. Uh, and another question asking you." Compared to forty uh, years ago, is it easier or harder to start study China today? <laughs> uh, the, we could, we could. I think we need a a, a beer or a cup of coffee to talk about this. Right um, uh, well, if if you're from a Nongchun and you went to Stanford, you are a hero. <laughs> and I know out in that audience there are many heroes. It's uh, 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 and you know because you said it right too is. You know, your if you were in a class with thirty, you know, thirty other students when you were sixth grade, you know, the other twenty nine are still in the village today, right? And yet you made it out, and um, that's what we need to to get over. We need, you know, we need twenty five out of thirty to go to high school and uh, 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 some sort of a vocational college or to college, right? Um, uh, or at least the high school. So. Uh, that you, that uh, that's our that's our goal. Uh, the second question about myself, uh, I've actually studied Chinese for fifty uh, five years. <laughs> yeah, so when a Zhongguo Hua, in Gai Gong Hao, right? Fifty five years, right? Uh, I started in in Los Angeles, in a suburb of Los Angeles, when I was twelve uh, years old. Um, it was right after China and Russia split. And uh, the U.S. government said we need we need to have someone speak Chinese uh, to be able to uh, uh, confront China in the future. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> uh, my my classmates from high school went to the State Department and to the Navy and to the government. And me, I I'm a uh, Berkeley. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a Berkeley grad. I, I had hair this long. And I tried to overthrow the American government, right? And so that my Chinese, I I I revered China in one hua da ge ming. Why is my jungle can you one hua da ge ming? One man. That's when we thought one hua da ge ming was a really good thing. Um, and I kept studying it. Um, and uh, China, right as I started my PhD program, China opened up for for work, and I went. And uh, uh, it was really hard then, <laughs> and it's really hard now. Um, in the middle, it was pretty easy. <laughs> so, uh, 
but um, uh, I collaborate with Chinese scholars. Uh, many of them are students or Chongbin students or our former colleagues, um, and they're they're great. Um, so um, that, that's you know that's sort of what you know what we do. It's a uh, um, and if you work on rural education, rural health, babies in rural China, you know it's it's not very sensitive, right? I mean, it's it's something that you're doing good. So I'll leave it there. So. Yeah, I, I, this question is from uh, a friend of us. So he asked, uh, you mentioned about the AI and also low education. How these two together will affect the labor, labor force and also income of people in China? Number one, uh, one month from today, uh, it's actually, I don't know exactly when Hong Min's gonna talk about that question. So, um, and, uh, but um, uh, no, I mean, so, this is, I think, the fallacy is, you know, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Turkey, South Africa have a really good cohort of, you know, it's not as big as China, but they're not as big as countries. They have a big cohort of well-trained people, right? Which is, you know, and China has a huge cohort of really well-trained people, but it's, you, you got to pick the whole economy up, right? So, so I, and and, and I get the AI, you, you almost have to do it. If, if China didn't go into robots and AI, what would happen is the, the firms would have to move out, out of China to another place. This is what happened to Mexico, right? All the factories in Mexico moved to China and look what happened to Mexico. So, so China's trying to keep those jobs there. I, you know, it's a great idea. The question now is, can you get a, a dual circulation economy the you know shind I, I forget how to say it in Chinese but you know can you have domestic demand drive growth and employ all the people and you know as you know even even the the Chenggong, the Nongmin, are AI right they're using Alibaba platforms and they're they're selling you you know uh, uh, organic fruit directly to your house but you know, most no mean you know, they, they barely know how to use you know a phone, right? So yeah. So uh, there are a few questions about. I mean, uh, uh, if you can give some advice to the government, uh, what the government can do now to address the issue, and are there I mean are there enough demand for education if you uh, offer good schools to the rural kids? Do they want to be stay in school? Uh, no, I, I, let, me say, let me answer the first question first and then the second question after that. Um, so I, I, I told you about half of our work with babies now. Um, because, you know, we tried, so, so our, our, our group in Sky, what we do what we call, you know, um, randomized control trials in the field. So uh, here's an example, okay, is you go out to rural schools, um, uh, you know, and you give the kids a test, right? An eye test and 30 to 30 to 35% of them are, you know, they're myopic, right? They can't see. Now I'm Jinshu. You see me taking my glasses on and off, right? Uh, now I'm Jinshu and I put on my glasses. I'm solved. I'm fine. I can see the blackboard. I can, I can study, right? But of these 30 to 40 percent of kids in these schools, six people who, th this was in 19, 2015, six of them who were nearsighted, one of them had glasses, five of them didn't have glasses, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, schools didn't give them glasses and everything. And, and we showed, so what we did is went to 100 schools and 50 schools we gave them glasses in 50 schools, we gave them zero and we came back after a year and guess what? <laughs> the, you gave them glasses, their, their, their grades were much, much higher than this. Now, then Zhao Yubu says, hmm, I don't care about glasses, I care about math scores. And, and now there's many uh, counties and provinces that are pushing that now. Um, and uh, so, so we did that kind of stuff. And, it raised their grades, but just a little, okay? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and we kept saying, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? We, we actually found that Lingdao San Sui is parents just, right? 
They don't talk to them. They don't read to them. They don't sing to them. They don't tell them stories. They don't, they don't stimulate them, right? They just don't know. And they say, why should I stimulate my kid? He's only two years old. He doesn't read, right? Uh, and, and so then we have, you know, parental, you know, we have parental training courses with the curriculum. And once you teach the parent, their kids at Sun Sui Kan Lao, by the time they're Sun Sui, they're perfectly normal, right? And, and we're actually following the first kids we did. They're now Shi Sui. We, we intervened when they were Yi Sui, and now they're Shi Sui, and they're all the top of their class, you know? So this is really important. Okay, so now the question, that's what we're doing, and, and it's gonna lead in seven. But doing this work for babies, mothers, we, we interviewed Yi Chen Babai, the mama, Okay. And we asked them, what is your educational aspiration for your child? This is great. This is great. You know, 95%. What did 95% say? 95% of moms and grandmas said, I want that kid to go to college. <laughs> right? I mean, only 30% or 35% of Chinese go to college now. 95% of they want them to go to college. Now, you remember what happened? Oh, wait a minute. Se what did 17% say? Oh, it's great. 17% of them said, I want my child to get a PhD. <laughs> you, know? And you know what I said? I go, no, 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 no. Don't get a PhD. If you get a PhD, you'll be poor like me, right? Get an MBA, right? Get an engineering master's in computer science, right? And, uh, uh, um, and um, so, uh, so they really, the educational aspiration is there. So uh, um, I don't think it's that they don't, and they'll spend money on their kids. They'll do anything to their kids. If a, if a known twin kid gets into college, uh, not one family they will figure out your banfa songtam and shangshe. Okay, so that's for. So what should we do? I can take too much long in this home being. We'll go to the next question, but I think we want to invest in better high schools. We need big investment in junior high. I think woman in guy fun ban kwai ban gan man ban at least for the next ten years. Okay, and then we need we need. My, we need glasses. We need uh, yin yang. Uh, you know, you We want ji sheng chong. Thirty percent of kids in not in Xinan have have intestinal worms today. Okay, but the biggest thing is we we need to invest in ling dao liu sui. Okay, and and I think you know I always say this: if if you go if you took from Xi'an to Urumqi. You take that money and invest it. You can give and let people fly from Xi'an to Urumqi. You know, I mean, I think that you just got to make it. You got to really increase education. Team. Okay. Yeah, I think this um, alumni asked a question. So he's company invested in many uh, firms in China. So he has seen a wage inflation. Uh, is this uh, representable like with the declining or uh, not, uh, education not increasing very fast? You see what I mean? So uh, on the one hand, education is not improving that fast. But on the other hand, wages increasing very fast. Uh, uh, but uh, but you're showing that uh, we just actually declining, right? In the past few years, right? Uh, yeah. So, so um, uh, a, a couple of things. So, I mean, there's there's two things that are happening. One is demand is growing very fast. I mean, right? Uh, 2012, 12 percent a year, then 10 percent a year, then 8 percent, then 666. Right? I mean, it's still demand is growing very fast. Um, there is, you know. Tui uh, shoulder in, right? Be, be Xin Jin Lai the new new labor force entrance, uh, uh, Dola, right? So there's fewer people coming in, so supply is a lower. That's pushed wages up, okay, uh, a lot. And there's, I mean, if you go to if you go to the the villages today, meet Jim Budao Igan Ninching the Nanren, right? That nobody's there. 
okay? At, at least until a few years ago, okay? Um, and, and even today, most of them are gone. So there's just no, no one left. Uh, the problem is, is that, is that as you saw, it's it, this new trend. Those were data from the government from 2015 to 2019, right? And, and so it's just the last couple of years that it's topped off. It's the growth rate of wages is now below um, uh, GDP growth, right? And I hope that it stops, right? It doesn't go negative, negative, okay? But um, uh, I call it the, Hongbin's paper is called the end of cheap wages. I, I call the new era the end of, end of cheap wages. So maybe, right? Our wage is going to start to fall. And we got to be really careful of that, right? Um, because if they start to fall, no mean way, right? Because for, like you said, I know you know, is for the past 30 years, wages have gone up, right? And people have had more employment opportunities. Um, you know, but they certainly are better off than they were 10 years ago. If they start saying, 10 years from now, I'm not going to be very well off. They aren't going to be very happy. And, and I think we want them part of this China, right? A few questions about the informal sector. So they believe that uh, when more people join the informal sector is the trend in the future. It's the like DD meeting all those firms, right? Uh, also, they found that many of the delivered uh, people, uh, boys and girls, actually have college degree, some have like even master degree, they still do the delivery. So why do they need so much education? That's the question. Uh, so first of all, not many of them have master's degrees and not many of them have college degrees. There are some, right? Exactly. Um, uh, uh, my, my second son, who was a Davis, a UC Davis grad, um, he had a uh, was disabled for a while. He 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 wrote D. He drove DD, right? We have a we have a colleague uh, at Stanford who drove DD and wrote a paper about it. <laughs> and uh, so there are those people there. Um, we're going to need a certain number of people in this informal economy. There's there's no problem, right? Um, but it's you know it's not. 60% of the weight uh, of the labor force or 70% of the labor force, right? That's the use. I mean, there's not a country in the world that turned to high income when 60% of the labor force was in this informal economy. Now, you're right, though, it's a new economy. And sometimes, you know, Fajan Jinji Shuja was pretty slow, right? Uh, and, and I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep my mind open is, you know, what's happening with digitization? Well, you know, you go to the Nong Twin and there's lots of digitization out there, right? Alibaba Twin and everything like that. But the people who take advantage of it have been the high school, okay? And the people who haven't, they just, they can't keep up, right? And, and so, yes, so we need a small share of the labor force who doesn't go to high school. In the U.S., and we have full employment, right? Yeah, we have wage polarization too. It's a problem, but uh, 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 but you know we can we can survive an economy like that. I, the, the trouble is, is how do we take care of you know you, you don't need that many to drive your DD. Um, uh, uh, okay. So a few questions are comparing China to other countries. So what lessons uh, can China learn from countries like the United States, Korea, either good or bad, so. Okay, so, so let me take South Korea because this is where I started working on education. I, 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 worked, I worked on uh, agriculture, <laughs> you know, and I, I love my work on agriculture. That's, you know, we worked with Wen Jia Bao on his agricultural, uh, work and, uh, uh, and and so that's what. But I, I I was in South Korea, and I was in a, a conference. Okay, and in the in this conference, um, there there was a, a a video documentary maker, and she says I'm going to show you two documentaries, one from 1978. I I won an award for this one. It, it was the the worst documentary I ever made. And I'm going to show you a documentary I made last year. 
1978 documentary, she snuck into a factory and she took, she took you know, uh, uh, films of, of the workers and, and she narrates it and she says, these poor workers, they're working 12 hours a day. And then at night, their bosses make them go to high school. They have to study math and they have to study English and they have to study Korean and, 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 and science at night. Isn't that terrible? That's what she says in 1978. Okay, what happens is in 2004, 88, 98, 25 years later, she goes finds those women, the same women in, in the factories. And guess what? They're working for banks. They're working for accounting firms. They're hotel managers. They, 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 they run their own, not, not Tan Fan Jingji, but they run their own you know, a bookstore or, or whatever, right? And, and they've made it into the white collar jobs, okay? And I think that's the lesson, right? We went into this factory, okay? We went into this factory. I, I can't tell you which factory, but you know. And we asked those workers, okay? And, and almost none of them had a high school degree. Where are you going to be in 10 years? And only 1% said, in the South Korea factories, 80% of the women went into the, into the biling gongzuo because they all were forced. And I think that's what has to happen. And so the lesson for China is everyone go to high school. They're trying that. But you know, but and then by from then you can study a Jiria, right? But you gotta learn because you have to know how do you learn how to learn? So I think those are the those are the real, real lessons. And the countries that made it, Ireland, Israel, uh, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan province, all of them invest, invest, invest in their human capital. So, so this, is, this is an interesting question. So this person runs an NGO uh, for rural education. So she described that. Uh, what I saw is even worse than you described in your book. She has read your book. Children are leaving school at a very young age. Uh, what in interventions can we do to help them to prevent this from happening? It's a very specific question, actually. <laughs> well, uh, I gave an Ishi talk. Probably a lot of you guys saw that in 2017, and I I said the same thing. I'm not even. I don't ever say the word dropout. I never say that word again out of ju junior high because I I got in lots of trouble because. Um, but um, uh, it does happen. Okay, it's a serious problem, uh, and I agree with you. Um, you know that. Um, uh, Yes, that uh, it can be very, very bad, the, the schools there. And there's lots of variation you know, across China, okay? So um, what I think we need to do, number one, and all those other countries, Brazil, Turkey, South Africa, Thailand, um, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Brazil, all of them now have Mian Fei, Ling Dao San Sui, the programs because they figured out that, you know, if you don't get, I mean, really everybody, the economists in the world now believe San Sui Kan Lao is so important. And that's the problem. So the, the, the kids you saw dropping out of school, even before high school, okay. Um, remember their moms wanted them to go to college. Their moms wanted them to go to college, but when they got to junior high, right? Because they didn't, and, and guess, oh, so, so I like to tell this, I'm going to tell it real quick. So we, we, we have this patient woman, where we teach the moms how to read and tell stories and play with their kids and have uh, conversations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the first month when the Ruhu gave them in patient or Tam and Lai, Jungshin patient, uh, e patient, the first month, 
you, you're trying to get them to read to their kid and their face turns red. <laughs> you know, I'm reading to my kid and they say, you really don't have to read to your child. You don't have to read to your child. You can just, you can just imagine that, right? Okay, and, and they don't, okay, that's month one. Come back month four or five or six, okay? And then they've got it. They see when they talk to their kid and stimulate their kid, their, their kid responds, right? And, and they're the smartest kid in the, in the neighborhood, right? And right? They, they're right? All that. And then you ask the mom, you go, do you read to your kid? And the mom goes, yeah. How much? Four hours every day. <laughs> I mean, these moms, once they figure out that this is really going to help their kids. They do everything. And, you know, Dao Yi Sui, by Fringer, Bash, or Dao Joshi, the Mama, Zai Jia, Bu Gong Zuo, right? They're full time moms until one. Han Duo Yi Sui, Yi Ho, Han Duo Shi Hui Chu Gong Zuo, which is another problem. But um, I, I so. think we are a bit over time. So, final mm -hmm. two questions. Okay, right? I'll be quick. Oh, yes. So, first question I, I think uh, three or four alarm asked the same question How can we be part of it? To help you and uh, help uh, China Research at Stanford. The second question is how to buy your, where to buy your book? <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, that's a, the second question. Uh, I've been to China more than 200 times in the last 40 years, but for the last 16 months, I haven't been to China. So I don't know. My book came out just a couple months ago. So I, uh, uh, I've sent about 60 books to China. <laughs> and uh, 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 so uh, uh, I, you'll have to figure that one out yourself. Or, or maybe I'll get through your, your the, the same. So that's, that's the, the, the first question. Second question is, um, I mean, to, to let me be straight, right? I mean, um, you know, when, when we started doing research, when I hired Hongbin, you know, we had money from uh, we had money from uh, uh, the World Bank, from, from UNICEF, from the We had money from Zhongguo uh, Zhengfu, uh, just to get Boquan, to get Waigoren, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, the, the US government. Today, there's none of that available. And so we live 100% off of donations. Um, so, so that's, that's number one. And, um, uh, you know, get a hold of Hongbin Lee or myself, um, just scie.stanford.edu and you come to our website. Um, but we also have, you know, programs where, um, we interact with your friends. We, uh, we give talks to schools. I think training our young urban kids about this problem now is really, really good. Uh, we interact with your, your collaborators uh, in your companies. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes companies can, you know, have you know, volunteer groups and that kind of thing. There's lots of ways that we can get involved. So um, I, I really appreciate the question. Yeah, thank you, Scott, again, for making the time uh, with us today and share your insights. And to all of you who are watching, live or later recorded. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you all, all stay safe and healthy and we look forward to connecting you to you again uh, very soon. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you everyone. Thank you Hongbin. Thank you uh, Leslie, Tina and the association.